Orwellian, which is another word that Alito used, like, what are you talking about? Like, have you read 1984? Orwellian is like in North Korea where you face immense physical danger for saying the wrong thing because the government will disappear you and probably your family. Can we please, and now I'm going beyond, he was implying this, reserve these words like censorship and Orwellian for the very serious things that actually a lot of people in the world still live under and not debase these terms to mean, oh, you know, Twitter blocked my account because I was saying there are microchips in the vaccines. Right. Which is the thing that Roger Stone said, as you pointed out. I made sure to fact check that my memory was correct, that he had actually said that. Uh, He says a lot of crazy shit. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Last week, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in yet another case with the potential to break the internet. It was a very weird hearing where Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson sounded alarmingly sympathetic to Team Internet Breaker, and Justice Brett Kavanaugh was the voice of reason. Dislike. Today, we'll talk to Corbin Barthold, an expert on the intersection between technology and the First Amendment, to try and make sense of this mess. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Hey guys, it's Liz Dye, tech genius, uh, relatively speaking. Compared to the Luddites on the Supreme Court, I am Steve Jobs. I listened to the oral arguments from Monday's Net Choice cases, and I'm uh, pretty sure that several of these jurists are walking around with flip phones in their pockets. Anyway, before we get into the nitty gritty of this case, I think it's important to acknowledge that it is grounded in pure bullshit. Right-wing loons like Ben Shapiro and Dan Bongino are constantly among the top performing posts on Facebook. They are in no fashion being shadow banned or discriminated against on social media. If they get their posts taken down more or slapped with a correction, it's because they flog a lot more fake news, i.e. lies. So if liberals had spent 2020 touting the joys of ivermectin and claiming that there was a conspiracy of pedophiles drinking babies' blood in the basement of pizza parlors in D.C., We would have had our posts taken down too, but we are not the ones flogging this QAnon insanity. We are also kind of shit at working the refs. So Republicans spent years screaming about shadow banning and censorship and algorithms that oppress conservatives just because they happen to post more disinformation. And then after that whole attempted overthrow of the government thing, the social media platforms all kicked Trump off, at which point his supporters lost their damn minds. And because his supporters control a bunch of state houses, they also passed a slew of laws seeking to correct the non-existent problem of social media platforms suppressing conservative speech. It should be noted that private companies can do anything they want on their sites. So if Facebook wants to ban the word xylophone or mentions of giraffes, it can do that. It can boost Nazis or pacifists or nudists or furries. That's kind of how private companies go, and it's the way that Republicans and conservatives thought it should be for a very long time. Nevertheless, Ron DeSantis, remember Ron DeSantis? Ron DeSantis had a hallucination that he was going to be president one day. So in preparation for the Republican primary, he started a bunch of idiotic culture war battles. Remember, DeSantis took on Walt Disney World and threatened to put a prison next to the parking lot to punish the company for criticizing his don't say gay law. 2023 was like the weirdest freaking year ever. Uh, Well, maybe. We'll see. 2024 is looking a little crazy, too. Anyway, as part of this windmill tilt, DeSantis got the Florida legislature to kind of whip up this insane social media law that empowered Florida residents to sue social media platforms for applying their standards unevenly, whatever that means. And the law imposed a $250,000 a day fine if a platform took down the account of any political candidate, no matter what that candidate did to violate the site's terms of service. So all you have to do is like get on your, I don't know, the ballot for the local school board and you can't be kicked off social media. Cool. So government compelled speech violates the First Amendment. That That's just black letter law. But Florida's law was apparently drafted on a cocktail napkin or, you know, maybe after a couple of cocktails. It was just 
gobbledygook. It applied basically to any website of a substantial size. It told them that they had to host all of this speech, like it or not. It was nuts. So a consortium of social media platforms plus Uber and Etsy, which got dragged into this thanks to the aforementioned crappy drafting, this this consortium sued under the moniker of a trade group called NetChoice. That's why the first case is captioned NetChoice v. Moody, Ashley Moody being the Florida AG. The Florida social media law was enjoined at the district court level, and that injunction was upheld at the 11th Circuit, which is, you know, a little wacko, but not totally nuts. That is not what happened with NetChoice v. Paxton, named for the Texas AG Ken Paxton. Side note, we're going to be doing a whole show on Ken Paxton at the end of the week because that guy is an exploding supernova of corruption, so get excited. Texas's social media law was more tightly drafted and marginally less illegal. It prohibited companies from removing content based on viewpoint, and it was like a little more careful about restricting its purview to social media sites and not, you know, every website on earth. Texas is also in the Fifth Circuit, which is full of lunatics. And so while the district court entered an injunction on the law that stopped it from going into effect, the Fifth Circuit would have let the law go into effect as the challenge went went through in the in the lower level court. When the Supreme Court agreed to hear the net choice cases, both the Texas and Florida law were enjoined. But it is hard to overstate what an absolute mess it will make if the court allows these laws to go into effect. Like if viewpoint discrimination is illegal and your site allows Holocaust historians or the Auschwitz Museum to post, it will also have to post Holocaust deniers and it can't take them down. You know, you want to allow the CDC to post? Well, you can't take down the Bleach Drinkers Alliance. You want to post the eating disorder hotline? Well, get used to being home to pro-anorexia content, too. Like, the the viewpoint discrimination piece in here, like, aside from being flagrantly against the First Amendment, will have a lot of really bad knock-on effects. And we'll have two states able to dictate content for these international platforms because like you can pull up Facebook in Sarasota or Galveston and you know if you can pull it up then you can sue these websites anyway it's crazy and worse still you'll have citizens able to sue the social media sites for like any quirk in the algorithm that they say disadvantages them and that's going to make the sites functionally unusable i mean example a like Twitter pre-Musk and Twitter post-Musk, it was a really good site before Elon Musk got in there and decided that, you know, algorithms were bad unless they kind of juiced people who were giving him money. Getting rid of these algorithms which prioritize specific content over others will make it a bad experience for users, and it will be not enticing to advertisers, as Twitter has found out. And, you know, above all that, again, that is not how the First Amendment goes, which is what Justice Kavanaugh said over and over during Monday's hearing. So before we get to the interview, I'm going to read to you a bit from our guest Corbin Barthold's article at the Daily Beast. The article is called, God Help Us, But Brett Kavanaugh Could Save the First Amendment. He writes, Kavanaugh wasn't interested in any of this bullshit. That's the nonsense meandering that the other justices were trying to pull. He didn't shotgun a beer, crunch the can against his head, rip his robe off and scream, First Amendment forever, motherfuckers. But that was the vibe. Inside serious, soft-spoken Justice Kavanaugh, yearbook page Brett was yearning to be free. While a judge on the Federal Court of Appeals, Kavanaugh had already written that it would be basically insane to let the government regulate the editorial decisions of Facebook and Google. Going into the argument, his take on these cases wasn't a mystery, but Kavanaugh has kept pretty quiet since joining the court, so it was a bit surprising to see him absolutely bring it yesterday. With his first words, Kavanaugh went right at these laws' diseased root. The concept that the government may restrict the speech of some elements of our society in order to enhance the relative voice of others, he said, quoting Supreme Court president, is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. By claiming to, quote, level the playing field for conservatives on social media, Kavanaugh made clear Texas and Florida are admitting that their laws violate the Constitution. Next, Kavanaugh called the states out for trying to turn the First Amendment upside down. In your opening remarks, he told Florida Solicitor General, you said the design of the First Amendment is to prevent suppression of speech, and you left out three words, by the government. When the government boots you from its public forum, that's often a First Amendment violation. When a private platform boots you from its service, that's its right to free speech and free association and action. Kavanaugh wasn't done on this score. He noted that the word censorship was being used in a lot of different ways at the argument. Indeed, content moderation by private services is mislabeled as censorship in HB 20 and SB 7072. 
Kavanaugh was having none of that. It's the government that censors, he explained, when it excludes speech from the public square in violation of the First Amendment, when, by contrast, a private individual or private entity makes decisions about what to include and what to exclude. That's protected editorial discretion. So that's a bit from the article, linking in the show notes, of course. Corbin is great. I am super excited for this interview. And I am also excited for Thursday when we will do our first live Q&A on YouTube. Please, please, if you are a subscriber at patreon.com slash law and chaos pod or on Substack at law and chaos pod.com, send us your questions either through the site or you can email at law and chaos pod at gmail.com. And in that vein, we are going to thank some of our supporters. We still have so many names of people who have signed up to support the show, but because we don't want to spend the whole show just listing names of people to thank, we'll continue to chew through this list of names on Mondays until we catch up, which is to say, if you signed up and haven't heard your name read on air yet, we promise we are going to get to you. And um, I am aware that this is a nice problem to have, so thanks a lot, guys. From Substack, thank you to Gordon Bob. Terry, Mike, Will, Mahler, Dimitri, Eleanor, Eric, S. Murph, David, Neoniel, Stephen, Pat, Crabman, Tim, Ian, Robert, Chris, Kay, and Judy. And from Patreon, thank you very much to Joey, Alexis, Rosa, I Just Listen, Leonard, Undefeated Breathing Champ since 65, woo! Kevin, Colorado May Snowstorm, Mark, Carson, Andrew, John, Holger, Aaron, I Mess With Texas, Becca, Marcus, Dana, Philip, CV, David, and Aliana. Thank you guys. We could not do this without you. So after this brief act break, we will get on with the interview. And with us today is Corbin Barthold of the nonpartisan think tank Tech Freedom, where he serves as Internet Policy Counsel and Director of Appellate Litigation. He's an expert on the intersection of technology and the law, and he spends his days shouting into the void in the hope that the octogenarians who draft our laws will please, for the love of God, stop treating the Internet like a series of tubes. This week, he had an amazing article on the net choice cases at the Daily Beast, in which he called Justice Brett Kavanaugh the hero of last Monday's oral argument. Corbin, thank you so much for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I always like talking to you because you are so much more libertarian than I am, and it challenges my priors every time because everything you say sounds completely reasonable, even if I know it's not reasonable. You've set a high bar for me today. But I'm <laughs> the best. I don't. I, what, what even am I anymore? Yes, but uh, yeah, I I know it's. Uh, I must must be rough to have your movement hijacked by the likes of. Ron I just Paul. think of myself as anti crazy, but I'm sure you feel exactly the same way about yourself. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Your mileage may vary, listeners. Yeah. Well, I, I feel a little crazy after the past eight years. But I know you want to get into the weeds. So I set the case up in the intro. But I would like to start with your best layman's explanation as to why Texas's HB20 and Florida's SB7072 are bullshit. And I, I know you've given this some thought because you filed an amicus brief on the subject. A simple way to describe why they are bullshit is that they would fundamentally break what social media is. Social media works because when you pull it up, if I mean, if it's working correctly, some platforms work better than others, especially these days, you don't get your feed flooded with hardcore pornography and graphic violence and uh, crazy conspiracy theories and you have recourse if somebody is harassing you and people are not encouraging you to commit suicide. And Florida and Texas's laws in their different ways would force social media platforms to have complete agnosticism as between that material and the stuff that you actually want to see when you pull up your social media feed. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about the First Amendment? I, I understand why it would be destructive to have these laws, but can we talk about why it would be illegal, right? Like, what, what is the challenge to these laws? Yes. So it is illegal because these platforms are fundamentally expressive. It's, it's many to many communications. It's not just that you are going to have a bad experience when you are on social media, seeing videos, encourage, you know, telling you how to do a better job of being an anorexic or whatever. Right. Eating um, Tide Pods. 
you're going to be angry at the platform for hosting that. You're going to do what these politicians do uh, when they're not passing these laws, which is yelling at the platforms to do a better job of not spreading this kind of information. And the whole reason people get so upset is because they understand that the platforms are making expressive choices when they choose to let people on their product spread these messages to the world, broadcast them out, Mm -hmm. and that they're making editorial choices about, well, we are going to be the kind of place that does not allow, you know, neo-Nazi dicks to go around spreading their ideology and uh, being bastards to everybody. Um, And if you are fundamentally making editorial choices and running an expressive product, that's what the First Amendment is there for. It gives you a right to spread the message that you want to spread and not the message that you don't want to spread. If the First Amendment doesn't protect that, then we have a problem. And I just want to tease out something that you just said. And we are seeing a real-time experiment right now, live, with Twitter as to what happens when you get rid of some of the guardrails. What the laws are saying is you platforms can't get rid of specific political content. You have to carry it. You, you have to kind of let us tell you what to run. And part of the point here is that the platform's viability is in its commercial value is in making the user experience good. And when the user experience is flooded with Nazis or, you know, pro-anorexia stuff, and if that floats to the top, then then nobody wants to be there. And that's exactly what's happening with Twitter since, you know, Elon Musk decided that he was going to instill an algorithm that either prioritized people who are willing to give him $8 or prioritized people who were jackasses. Yes, I think sometimes people get a bit hung up specifically on advertisers Mm -hmm. and how they won't advertise and it'll break the business model. And all of that is true. And all of that is a reason to be against these laws. But that's maybe not the strongest First Amendment argument because you know the government can put burdens on businesses that are bad for that business's bottom line and you know i'm not sure everybody is out here worrying about how disney is doing or whatever about them protecting their brand but then that next point you said the fact that the users get disgusted by all of this and leave it's not simply that they are having a bad experience many people are going to leave because they're going to say okay i see elon musk's message Mm -hmm. as conveyed by the choices his platform makes about the kinds of vile things he's willing to platform and spread and force me to to face when I'm just trying to have a conversation or whatever. And that's where you really get into the core of these platforms are in the speech business. And that makes them fundamentally distinct from all kinds of other businesses that can be regulated in ways that, you know, uh, don't have a First Amendment impact. Right. And let's be clear, only the government is subject to the First Amendment, right? You you know, I can't say I'm done with you, cut your microphone and then, you know, have violated the First Amendment. Platforms cannot violate the First Amendment, basically definitionally. We live in very interesting times with that. I um, So that Daily Beast article, which I'm sure we'll touch on, I've heard it mentioned on a few other podcasts and I've had law professors, one, one law professor said, Well, you know, if you want to be simplistic about it, yeah, you read the First Amendment and it says Congress shall make no law as the first words. But that's very that's very formalistic. (laughs) And, um, you know, I I law professor have a more middle ground and view uh, these platforms as the public square and we should be able to regulate them. And that's not an un reasonable position, but I it does tickle me that um, this person was sort of willing to say the quiet part out loud of like, well, here's what the First Amendment says at the very beginning in very explicit terms. But, you know, that's just formalistic to take that seriously. We need to be more nuanced. So we live in strange times in the sense that a lot of people on the right used to take those opening words very seriously Mm -hmm. and now are all about co-opting these platforms because they're against, you know, woke corporate power and they sound the way that liberals used to. You have some liberals who are sort of forgetting their suspicion of corporate power, and it's good to be suspicious of corporate power. And you know, maybe they're now embracing a, a view of the First Amendment that used to be a more quote unquote conservative view. You have some on the left who are sticking to their guns laudably and continuing to say, I don't trust anybody in this situation. But the the ground is is shifting. It's just um 
there aren't clear sides anymore the way there were even maybe 10 years ago back in, you know, the Citizens United era. And we certainly, I think, saw that at oral argument. Long story short, though, yes, I am in the camp that reads those opening words and uh, don't find this to be terribly complicated. It's the government that can violate the First Amendment, uh, not you in kicking me off this podcast, not me in blocking someone on Twitter and not even Twitter writ large back when it used to say, you know, you're not welcome here neo-Nazi dick. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you. And I'm pretty liberal and I and I appreciate that there is a serious problem. Like we are we are in the middle of a problem that is, you know, I think in the olden days that we used to say, well, the solution to the problem of bad speech is more speech. I don't believe that anymore. I just still think that the First Amendment isn't the solution to that problem. And you look, you can look at Elon Musk, right? He allowed more speech on Twitter and it's it's immeasurably worse, right? It's it's clearly worse. And he, you know, having done that, having seized the means of production is basically backed off of all of his platitudes about it being, you know, him being a First Amendment absolutist. He just kicks off people who like, you know, tweet out the coordinates of his plane at will. So obviously he, I mean, or, or if the Indian government says you have a post which pissed off Narendra Modi, it disappears. So I would agree with you that um, that we are in strange times, but I'm with you. I think the First Amendment means what it means, and I can't censor anybody else's speech because I'm not the government. And you know who else agrees with that? Uh, Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that where we're yeah. going? Yeah, that's where we're going. Go on. Tell us your tell us your thesis. Tell us why yeah. Brett Kavanaugh is not such a piece of shit that we all thought he was. One very quick point. Just yeah, you can uh, you can think that my view of the First Amendment is simplistic, and you can think that more speech is that. the answer to bad speech. Uh, not you specifically, Liz. Right. You listener, yeah. and you can think that the the phrase "more speech" is the answer to be naive and simplistic, and still think it's a terrible idea to have the government be the source of any kind of solution here. That that the government in this particular context is capable of just making things worse. I, I'm sorry. Um, there's no problem for which Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis are the solution. There, there is no problem they cannot and will not make worse. OK, so to Brett Kavanaugh. And as I say in the piece, the, the piece opens with, look, you don't have to like Brett Kavanaugh. Mm-hmm. You can hate him now. You can go on hating him after this article is over. But he is principled here. Actually, I tend to use Brett Kavanaugh and Merrick Garland as mere images of each other. This is somewhat of a side note of, Uh there are other justices on the court that I don't know what they're saying in their chambers, but I would be willing to bet a lot of money that if you could be a fly on the wall in Brett Kavanaugh's chambers, Mm -hmm. similarly to in Merrick Garland's office, because he gets all this heat from both sides, they're having serious conversations. They're not sitting there going, how can I help? you know, in Brett Kavanaugh's case, like the Christo fascist nationalists or like, how can I help Donald Trump? He may reach results that you hate, but he's, he is not in there like scheming. I would put it to you that that's kind of a conspiracy theory. Maybe uh, asterisk abortion. I mean, even in Dobbs, which I definitely am not going to dive into that minefield with you. I don't think he was sitting there uh, having any other motive than, Hey, I think Roe versus Wade was wrong. Okay. At any rate, he has always been the First Amendment is not about balancing out relative voices. It is not about making sure we have an equal size soapbox. It is very much a negative right that makes sure that the government stays out of the way. And he was just very strong in voicing that view during the argument. And he was willing to push back on arguments, including by those who are now sort of in the bag for the sort of MAGA populist view here. And uh, to give an example, his finest moment in the argument, in my view, came when Justice Alito was trying to say, hey, you know, isn't content moderation actually this sort of Orwellian term that Mm -hmm. we use to euphemize a vile practice that actually amounts to censorship? And Kavanaugh came back very respectfully, but basically he smacked that down saying the notion that getting your tweet blocked on Twitter, like what a first world problem. Yeah. Censorship is something that happens when the government stifles speech by taking over the media. Like this is something we actually see in other countries like in Mm -hmm. Venezuela. Mm -hmm. 
Orwellian, which is another word that Alito used, like, what are you talking about? Like, have you read 1984? Orwellian is like in North Korea where you face immense physical danger for saying the wrong thing because the government will disappear you and probably your family. Can we please, and now I'm going beyond, he was implying this, reserve these words like censorship and Orwellian for the very serious things that actually a lot of people in the world still live under and not debase these terms to mean, oh, you know, Twitter blocked my account because I was saying there are microchips in the vaccines. Right. Which is the thing that Roger Stone said, as you pointed out. I made sure to fact check that I, my memory was correct, that he had actually said that. Uh, yeah. He says a lot of crazy shit. So that was Kavanaugh. I mean, he I thought he put in a strong performance. I, uh, you know, you can think what you will about him. And I, I that's fine. I am not here to defend mm-hmm. yearbook page Brett, as I referred to him <laughs> at one point in the article. That's a great article. We're definitely linking to it. But especially on the Supreme Court. Take your wins where you can. You know, many has been the argument where I was saying huzzah for Justice Kagan or huzzah for Justice Sotomayor. It's it's, it is actually good to recognize the cases that are not these straight six, three things that get Mm -hmm. people very angry Mm -hmm. and understand that um, in a lot of areas of law, there will be strange bedfellows and to embrace that. Yeah, I, I I don't want to spend too much time on it, but Justice Katanji Brown Jackson was making some very odd statements, which seemed quite sympathetic to Texas and Florida's positions here, and I was really shocked to see it. Sure, although one thing worth mentioning now, I was less surprised, but only because she did the same thing in uh, Gonzalez versus Google, yes. which was a case last year about mm-hmm. Section 230, the online uh, intermediary protection. And she did the same thing where she was very sympathetic to what I would call these MAGA adjacent views, which is very interesting. She's clearly a wild card here. She is clearly in play. Uh, And yeah, we can dip into that later. Yeah. Okay. But you know what? Since you bring up Section 230, let's talk about it because Gorsuch, Alito, and Thomas, they just kept wandering off into nonsense about Section 230. So actually, I'm going to set you up here by giving our lay listeners a really simplistic definition of Section 230 and what it does. And then you can explain how these three conservative weirdos are being totally disingenuous because I I think we ought to nip this nonsense in the butt. So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, specifically subsection C1, is often called the 26 words that created the internet. And those 26 words are, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So basically, it immunizes websites for user-generated content. So if you, like, post on Reddit that I have falsely held myself out as a member of the bar, I can sue you for defamation and say you were reckless because it's a matter of public record that I was sworn in in 2001. But I can't sue Reddit for hosting your defamatory speech. And by the same token, you can't sue Reddit for taking down your speech for any reason. That is in Section uh, 230C2. And before conservatives kind of came up with these fakakta laws saying that you can't take the president off the internet or any political candidate, conservatives like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz concentrated their fire on repealing 230 because they said that by exercising editorial discretion, that is like kicking off Donald Trump for inciting uh, an insurrection and, you know, kicking anti-vax loons off the site, the websites became publishers and thus became liable for the content. They forfeited this immunity. Or I guess their argument was if they didn't forfeit that immunity, then the law should be scrapped to, you know, make it easier to sue the websites. And in fact, Donald Trump forced Mitch McConnell to override a veto of the defense spending bill in 2020 because Trump was so hot to get rid of 230 that he said it was actually necessary to the national defense to repeal it. So with that set up, explain to me what Gorsuch and Thomas and Alito were arguing about Section 230 in this case, which is not about Section 230, and and tell us why it's disingenuous. This argument clearly established, not that I didn't already think this, that Mm -hmm. we are going to be fighting against boneheaded understandings of Section 230 for as long as Section 230 exists. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Gonzalez versus Google a moment ago. That case was squarely about Section 230. There was tons of briefing. We all got into what is wrong with the views of Gorsuch and Thomas here and explained in detail 
how the law is actually, you know, what it does. And it is so discouraging to have the Supreme Court punted in that case. They realized it was way more complicated than they thought, as you and I discussed uh, when that case was heard. And so they they left it alone. And to now a year later, have Gorsuch and Thomas come back as if nothing happened, as if nobody (laughs) explained this to them. And moreover, to punt in a case where Section 230 is squarely on the table and now suggest that they want to do something revolutionary with it in this case where it's a total side issue. Very frustrating. Okay, so what did they do? You actually took us through a pretty good short history of the right wing misunderstanding of Section 230. I would I put it into two phases. I call it platform versus publisher fallacy mm-hmm. 1.0 and platform versus publisher fallacy 2.0. Platform versus publisher fallacy 1.0. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he originated it, but the perhaps loudest exponent of it was Ted Cruz. It holds that you are a platform protected by Section 230 unless your content moderation choices are not neutral. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? God only knows. Like, there's nothing about neutrality in the law. They just made this up. They pulled it out of nowhere. That if, oh, well, if you're not neutral you then revert to being a publisher and you lose your Section 230 protection. And that was so nuts that it never got any traction in the courts. Even Ted Cruz ended up abandoning it and having a new theory when he submitted an amicus brief in Gonzalez versus Google. What ended up happening was there was a shift to platform versus publisher fallacy Mm 2.0. And that holds that... Section 230, there's not a choice. It's not like, oh, you decide to be neutral and you keep your Section 230 protection. It is a simple binary that by passing Section 230, Congress stripped any entity protected by it of its First Amendment rights. That by becoming a protected entity under Section 230, you are no longer a speaker because you don't have legal liability for what you're saying. And uh, Judge Andy Oldham actually bought fifth this circuit. in the Fifth Circuit, a, a lower court decision that led us to these net choice cases. And when Gorsuch at oral argument says, I thought that by getting Section 230 protection, uh, these entities became common carriers. That is what he's tapping into. He is tapping into platform versus publisher 2.0. Got it. What is what is wrong with this? What is wrong with this? Well, there's a couple things wrong with it. I mean, number one, The First Amendment is what it is. It's the Constitution, right? Like you learn this pretty early on in law school that Congress cannot amend the Constitution by statute, right? So Congress cannot pass a law that narrows your First Amendment rights. That is that is not how this works. Right. Not a thing. But then also, that's not what they tried to do. You have a First Amendment right to editorial control over your uh, newspaper or your parade, or in this case, your social media platform, if what you're doing is expression, you have a First Amendment right to choose which message you're going to present. You also have a liability protection under Section 230 Mm -hmm. to not get sued for, and it's important to say most, for most of the speech that you repeat. There are exceptions to Section 230. Right. And that's it. It's really not actually that complicated. There's a First Amendment right that protects your expressive choices. And then there's an additional Section 230 liability protection, and they are distinct things. And that doesn't mean that there aren't reasons to criticize Section 230 or to think it could work better, to amend it. But like, can we at least understand it first? Yeah. And to kind of end where I began, it was very discouraging to see what I would call like a deep regression, just a stubbornness from Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch in particular to pretend like we didn't just have this conversation. Yes. And I would submit to you that I don't think that they're regressing and that they didn't understand. I think they understand perfectly well. They just don't like it. And and that I would go even further to say they don't like it because they think it disadvantages conservatives. And look, I mean, Abbott and and DeSantis were very clear that the purpose of this law is to level the playing field as they see it in favor of conservatives because they think that the platforms are against conservatives. Now, you could make the counter argument that that's because liberals aren't out there telling people to like inject themselves with ivermectin to cure, uh, you know, a viral pandemic and that 
there is a lot less conspiratorial thinking. You know, we're not the ones who are flirting with QAnon. But, okay, that's kind of to the side. That is the directed thinking. I don't think that Gorsuch and Alito and Thomas don't understand. I think they understand. I think that they, in fact, much of this, I think, was them kind of pretending not to understand. I'm not sure that Barrett understood the argument. I got to be honest. But um, they understood exactly what they were doing. But can I double you back? Because you were talking about common carrier. And that's something that we as lawyers kind of have internalized. But I don't think everybody understands that. Can you walk me through that common carrier thing? Sure. And that is what, uh, for Tech Freedom, I submitted an amicus brief in this case, Mm -hmm. focused on this issue. And I thought the oral argument was a pretty mixed bag overall. But it was a good day for killing the common carrier theory in this case, Uh I thought. If you sort of ignored what the lawyers were arguing at the justices and just looked at what the justices said, they really didn't seem to have much appetite for this theory. What is what is common carriage? It goes way, way back. I mean, Judge Oldham in the Fifth Circuit traced common carrier, the concept back to like the 15th century in England, which side note, I. I don't really understand the like old is good thing here. Like I'm not particularly (laughs) interested in what Henry the sixth's judges, like how they tackled matters of like law and economics, Mm -hmm. but it evolved over time to like, if we fast forward to the 19th century, the quintessential example of a common carrier is a railroad. So a railroad quite possibly has sort of bottleneck control over transporting the like boxes of pears from you know, the East Coast to the West Coast or a region to another region. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of controversy over these very powerful companies sort of discriminating among customers that on bases that didn't make much sense, you know, to price gouge here and cost cut there and kneecap competitors and give out favors to people and nobody really liked it. So, you know, common carrier law says, if it's a comparable product over a comparable distance or whatever, you have to charge everybody the same price. Mm-hmm. But as that description should always su- already suggest, at its core, common carriage is about uh, the regulation of carrying like commodities, like right. stuff over distances. Now, right. it did expand modestly in the early 20th century to the telephone and the telegraph, but not as much as like Texas will make it out to be like, if you and I are having a telephone conversation, we're having a private conversation between two people. It actually is kind of one way to think of it is like widgets of information being carried Mm -hmm. over a dumb pipe. And that is fundamentally different from social media where we've got this many to many communication being broadcast out. And so there's this expressive component that's really fundamental to it that's not present with those earlier things. So it's kind of a non sequitur to try to jam the social media product into the common carrier framework. Right. But actually, more importantly, it's just not clear what the common carrier thing is doing here. So if you're Texas or Florida, what you want to argue is that social media is not fund or at least the platform its choice of what to to spread and what not messages that that's not expressive and if you succeed in showing that that's not an expressive choice like you're kind of home free like you've gotten the first amendment out of the way and you'll win and if you fail in doing that you're going to lose adding in the common carrier thing it's kind of like an epicycle. Like it doesn't really add anything. It's a common law concept that judges could extend out to a new product. In doing so, they would be narrowing the First Amendment. Like the First Amendment protects or it does not. And so that seemed to be something the justices grasp. Like Justice Barrett at one point, one of the lawyers brought common carriage up and she said, please just put that aside and answer my question. Yeah, I, I, I will say the reason I think that they continue to bring it up is that it appears to be a kind of place where the people who want the want to gut 230 and want to, you know, kind of exact control over these websites that look, you know, they keep bringing it up because Justices Alito and Thomas keep bringing it up, right? I, I don't think that it's going to be the one that carries the day. And it's pretty clearly not going to carry the day here. But I don't think we've heard the end of it. I mean, I understand what it's doing here, not not from a logical standpoint, but from a like practical or strategic standpoint. But let's take a brief ad break. And then I want to come back and talk about facial versus applied challenges, because I know that you have a lot to say on that topic. Fantastic.
And we're back. Okay, let's do this. Let's talk about the facial versus applied argument because that seemed like it kind of came out of left field and all the lawyers arguing this were like, wait, what? That's what we're going to talk about here? Yes. So we, if we're going to do justice to what occurred at the argument, we have to get into this. And so yeah. I apologize to anybody who finds it ending up getting too into the weeds. I will try not to to get obscure and explain all terms, but you need to understand this ended up being a huge chunk of the argument, mm -hmm. very unexpectedly in my view. All right. Do you want to define it? You're going to define yes. facial? Okay. So the first thing we need to do, you're bringing a lawsuit, you're challenging a law. You can challenge it as applied. And that's mm -hmm. most lawsuits. That's saying, look, this law is unconstitutional as applied to me. Court, please protect me by just making it so the state cannot enforce this law against me. And that's as applied. Facial challenge, as its name suggests, it's saying, I think this law is just straight up unconstitutional, period. Please, you know, court, burn it with fire. <laughs> and the uh, net choice, the, the representative of the platforms in these cases, they brought facial challenges to both the Texas and the Florida law. The next thing to know is that there are special rules in the context of the First Amendment. So if the law is regulating something uh, like a consumer protection of whether I'm following like the health and safety code in the bathrooms in my building, facial challenge is going to be real hard because I need to show that the law is unconstitutional in every single application. If the mm -hmm. state can raise one instance uh, or at least a tiny handful of instances where the law constitutionally applies, my facial challenge loses. In the context of the First Amendment, the courts are afraid that laws can chill speech. So they're more, they have a special solicitude to if I say this law, it's unconstitutional in lots of applications, they're going to give me a hearing on that. And actually, the court has gotten more lenient over time. It used to be there was something called overbreadth, where I actually had to admit that the law was valid as to me and then seek to get it struck down by saying, but there's this chilling overbroad effect that it is mm -hmm. unconstitutional as applied to a lot of other people. And the court seems to have ditched that. A couple of recent decisions have said over, uh, sorry, a uh, facial challenge under the First Amendment, what you need to show is there are a substantial number of unconstitutional applications in relation to the law's plainly legitimate sweep. And what was remarkable at the argument, because if you hear those terms, you're going to think, well, these laws go after these major social media platforms and what they do on the news feed. There you go. There's a bunch of unconstitutional applications, so we don't need to worry about maybe the details here. Law should be struck down. But several of the justices from both ends of the ideological spectrum came in and cited the facial challenge standard for non-speech laws. They said, well, you know, have you shown that this law is unconstitutional in all its applications? And so that then led us into this discussion, in particular in relation to the Florida law, of, well, does it govern Uber? Does it govern Etsy? Does it govern every function that the social media platforms do? Because if there are these other constitutional applications, then maybe we cannot uphold the preliminary injunction here. Maybe we need to vacate the decision, which basically means let this law go into effect, send it back down to the trial court and have the trial court parse out all the different applications and figure out when it's constitutional and when it's not. So the way that that worked out in the hearing itself is basically they said, well, what about Gmail? Can Google censor Gmail or can Google refuse to give, you know, the Proud Boys a Gmail account or something like that, right? And would that be um, something that, that could be regulated because it wasn't the First Amendment, because it was more like a common carry or whatever? And they said, well, I have now envisioned a, a scenario of conduct prohibited by this law, which we don't think violates the First Amendment, and therefore it can't you know, this facial challenge isn't the right vehicle. Maybe this isn't the right vehicle. Maybe you, the net choice plaintiffs who challenged the law in, in Texas and Florida, maybe you guys made a mistake. You should have done as applied challenges and not challenges to the whole law. And maybe if we can think of one exception, you guys lose and the law goes into effect while you guys fight about it. Yes, that is basically correct. I mean, there's a great irony here that 
Florida, by virtue of writing a very vague, very sloppy, yes, uh, very poorly thought through law, is now potentially going to win at this stage precisely because they put so little thought into actually crafting their law. So when they came to the Supreme Court, they and below as well, they accepted the framing that what we're fighting about here is whether, you know, your social media news feed is an expressive product of the platform. Florida was totally down with arguing that. They said, no, it is not. You know, it's conduct or it's a dumb pipe, whatever you want to do, but the First Amendment does not protect that. And the 11th Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals that hears things out of Florida, says, we accept that too. And it ruled in favor of the platform, saying these things are expressive based on pretty bedrock Supreme Court precedent. Mm -hmm. It actually was a total curveball to get up to the Supreme Court and have the justices be saying, well, what about all of these other potential applications? And it was a little bit amusing to see Florida Solicitor General turn on a dime and go, oh, yes, well, now that you mention it, yeah, I I do think there's this terrible problem with uh, the facial challenge, and this is all so very, very complicated. And yes, we really, what we really wanted to do was um, regulate Uber's comments, you know, that, you know, make, we want to make the world safe for people who put racist comments on their driver's profile. You know, that was our real aim. I'm being sarcastic. He didn't say that, but. Well, even worse than that, I think that he was actually actively disingenuous, that he, I believe it was Gorsuch said, well, suppose that, you know, Uber says that it doesn't want to like pick up black passengers. Is that allowed? Is that expressive conduct? And and that nobody is suggesting that, right? We're talking about racist comments and could the website take them down? But this is why I say that I think that the conservative justices had so little integrity here because Gorsuch pretended that it was this kind of wholesale racist thing that the plaintiffs were advocating for or advocating that the that should be in the control of the websites. And he knew bloody well that it was just a comment section that that they were talking about. But then I also thought it was pretty funny the way former Solicitor General Paul Clement, who was arguing for the net choice plaintiffs um, or the net choice appellants, argue, you know, was like, what is happening here? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Like, <laughs> we won on the higher standard. And now you're saying, why didn't we win on the lower standard? We won on the high standard. We like jumped the really high hoop. At one point in, in exasperation, he said something like, you're heading towards the worst First Amendment yes. decision in the court's history. I mean, I stuck up for Brett Kavanaugh's integrity. What I will say about Gorsuch, and I've said it to you before, I think Gorsuch, his North Star, he would never admit it, is to show the world how clever Neil Gorsuch is. Mm -hmm. So I would put it to you that there is an element of, look at how, like, everybody teed it up and briefed it and argued it this way, but I came up with this example that nobody has thought of, and I see it in this, like, 4D chess way, right? which is not terribly flattering either, but that's my read on why he is always coming in from left field with, you know, well, what about Uber? Yeah. Well, also, he likes to do it right after. Like Alito will say something batshit crazy in his like, you know, really argumentative voice. And then Neil Gorsuch comes in quietly and says a similarly crazy thing. But he says it in such a calm, rational fashion that you almost think it sounds good, but it actually doesn't sound good. It's batshit crazy. That's uh, that's that's funny. The person I will pick on and I'll use this as a vehicle for explaining why I don't think this facial challenge stuff is ultimately going to be a problem. Alito, if you go into the case law, you, Liz, will be shocked to hear he's not terribly consistent on this stuff. Get um, out. Yeah. So there was a case called uh, United States versus Stevens. It was about depictions of, uh, I think it was animal crush videos. But the issue was this law of like trying to ban animal cruelty in videos. And in the opinion for eight justices, Chief Justice Roberts said, look, this is very overbroad. There's different standards across the country. You know, we're not going to be able to, to agree about like a bullfighting video versus like cockfighting, which was still legal in Puerto Rico until like a year earlier in that instance or like all kinds of other things. So the law is overbroad and they uh, struck it down. And Alito stuck up for the very old standard I referred to earlier, actually, about overbreadth. And he wanted to say, look, a facial challenge or a sweeping injunction here is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a few years to a decision called Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta. California tried to require nonprofits to tell the state privately who their donors are. 
And there was worry that the state would not be good at keeping these private, which I will say California is pretty bad at protecting those sorts of things. But then the issue became how many nonprofits actually care if their donors are public or not? How many of them are actually going to be chilled? Mm -hmm. And Alito was happy to join a majority opinion, again, by Roberts saying, uh, look, lots of nonprofits are going to be worried about this. That's enough for this substantial number of unconstitutional instances. Mm -hmm. And they struck it down on a facial challenge. And Sotomayor in dissent said, whoa, 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 you're striking down the entire law in all of its applications, even though it's like you're citing a handful of nonprofits that are bothered by this. The vast majority of nonprofits do uncontroversial things and wouldn't care if their donors are public. And so this is a hogwash case for a facial challenge. That case is lying in the background there. So there's several things the court could do here. They could say, look, say what you will about APA versus Bonta and the alignment there, but like Alito, if he's being consistent, is going to have to stick by his guns on that decision. Sotomayor and Kagan could say, we were in the dissent there, but what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So the facial challenge here succeeds. So they could get around it that way. And then two other things I'll mention very briefly. They could say that this law, because it targets specific speakers and it was pretty clearly the, an pre I say pretty clearly, it was freaking obvious. Uh, yeah. They didn't from hide Florida it. and Texas, who they were targeting, even though they tried to kind of hide it in the law itself. Right. You cannot suppress or mandate or regulate speech targeting specific speakers. Big no-no under the First Amendment. And they could say, look, even if some of these applications are constitutional, even if direct messaging is ultimately not expressive or whatever, your law is a blunderbuss piece of crap and we're going to uphold the injunction because you are engaging in speaker discrimination. And there's a couple cases that are very strong for that point. One of which was a Louisiana governor back in the day, it was called Gross John, saying he'd go after the lion newspapers and, you know, <laughs> don't do that. Don't say that's what the purpose of your law is. And then finally, for all of you nerds out there, it's Supreme Court Rule 14.1a says, if you are petitioning the Supreme Court for review, you had better tell us in your question presented what you want us to decide. And if the issue that comes up later is not in that question, we are not going there. We are treating the case as teeing up what that question is. Now, it's a little weirder because it was the justices themselves diving into the stuff and, you know, they can do whatever the hell they want. But... They could easily just dismiss the Florida case as improvidently granted because they ended up drifting to these issues outside the question presented. And if they do that, dismissing the case in that posture, the judgment below would stay in place. The law would continue to not be in effect. And they could easily say, look, this is not the proper vehicle, but you should address these things on remand or whatever. Um, so there are three clear ways that they could get out of this jam that they have created for themselves. Well, wait, let me interrupt before you go. I want to talk about something which we didn't bring up, which is that this is just an injunction at this point, right? So that the Florida court enjoined this law, which was pretty well, preliminary clearly, injunction. Exactly. Preliminary injunction. It was preliminarily enjoined. The Florida court enjoined this in this statute, which was very clearly enacted as part of DeSantis's like, I'm the biggest culture warrior of all when he was, you know, going to be president. And, and then he didn't. Ha you know, he didn't become president, but we're still stuck with all of these horrible litigations. It but should be noted at every possible juncture, by the way, that they had an exception for theme parks originally in the law yeah. that was specifically for Disney. And then Ron DeSantis got his whole woke war against Disney. And then they stripped that out. That's how cynical this whole thing is. So. Yeah. And then DeSantis said he had no idea that it was in the law. He, I mean, he's he's full of shit. But in in. Texas, the trial court enjoined the law, but the Fifth Circuit put it back in, and then the Supreme Court stayed it while while this was going on. But if you are if you are right, and they say, well, this is a dig, you know, improvidently granted decision, improvidently granted, and it has to go back, we're going to wind up with like a whole hot mess, right? Because the law is going to go into effect in Texas and not go into effect in Florida, and we're going to wind up with this like pastiche of, of crazy, right? It, it is going to, I don't think it's going to break the internet in the, in the same way that the, you know, the, the Gonzalez v. Google case had the potential to, but it has a, it's going to be a big problem. Well, 
everybody tries to lump these laws together and for all kinds of reasons that's good but no no you could separate these out see because texas is the whole problem that led the justices down this rabbit hole is that Florida has a very broad definition of who's covered. It, it's not actually social media platforms. It's basically very large websites. All websites, right, with Texas, more than 50 million users a year or something or a month. Yeah, it's 100 million users globally or 100 million in revenue. So that's how you get in like an Uber that nobody thinks of as actually being mm-hmm. this law. Texas did do a better job of defining who's covered as actual, what we think of as social media. Users get a profile and they interact with each other and it's public. That's not exactly how they worded it. Point being, you could, not saying this will happen, you could say we reverse the Fifth Circuit because we can just address the core issue of the editorial right of social media platforms over whatever their newsfeed. And we dig the 11th Circuit case because it's a more complicated law with all these bells and whistles, and they go back and figure it out. You could do that. Right. But we're still going to have, unless the legislators in those states kind of go back and rethink, we're still going to have trials because this is only a preliminary injunction. Is that correct? Yes. So this is still going to go back down, and there will be all kinds of extra process. You know, the states clearly are going to hone their arguments uh, they're going to glean a lot of sort of ammunition from mm-hmm. what the justices said. It is also worth pointing out that the platforms have other arrows in their quiver, you know, arguing that these laws are vague, arguing that most or all of them are preempted by Section 230, arguing that the Dormant Commerce Clause applies here, which without getting into that can of worms, Justice Gorsuch, your favorite, actually all but gutted the dormant commerce clause in a case involving uh, pork producers. So uh, that is no longer nearly as strong an argument. You'd think that 50 states couldn't do completely contradictory social media laws, but uh, at, yeah. So there are many other moving pieces that could come into play here. Yes. Do you have any guesses? You want to you wanna put down a marker as to what this is going to shake out to be, at least at this stage? Yes. I have game theory this out, and I am happy to throw a hostage to fortune. Love it. So we know where Brett Kavanaugh stands, uh, yeah. as as we've discussed. Um, indeed, Weirdly, he, he stands with us, and I'm not used to this feeling. And uh, well, I mean, I'm glad, but also, ew. Yeah, well, even, um, even before he was on the Supreme Court, he'd made it clear that he thinks it's insane to let the government uh, regulate what speech social media platforms carry. So he's he's locked in, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Chief Justice Roberts didn't say too much at oral argument, but he did say that the strongest precedent for Texas and Florida, a case called Rumsfeld versus Fair, about law uh, schools having to allow military job recruiters on their campus. He said, no, and he authored that opinion. He said, no, 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 that case has no bearing here. Strong signal that he is going to be for the platforms here. Right, because the law schools were taking money from the federal government, so they couldn't, you know, they were federally subsidized. They became, in some sense, state actors, and so they couldn't, you know, keep the ROTC recruiters out. Among among other distinguishing features. I mean, right. to make that case look like this one, it would have had to have been about allowing, like, neo-Nazis to lecture in the lecture rooms and, like, maraud the hallways. I mean, that case is so far off. Right. I digress. Uh, Justice Barrett, Uh, who's shown a certain minimalist approach on the court. She said the platform seemed to be... Yeah, I'm sure you have cases where you don't feel that's the case. But um, she uh, said these platforms seem closer to newspapers than they do to the telephone in so many words. Oh my God, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. It's it's none of those things. Nobody has a telephone anymore. But yes, I I mean, I I take your point. I'm just, I'm I'm giving you my reasons for why I think people are so. So you've got uh, Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Roberts all probably with the platforms. Sotomayor and Kagan uh, both, I think, recognize that these laws are bonkers Mm -hmm. and are badly crafted and are sort of First Amendment menaces. Yeah. So I'm not saying that they will join something that says the platforms have editorial control and a story, but um, I'm confident they will say without reaching conclusions about what you can do, states, you can't do this. Yes. And there's five votes. There's five votes for sanity. Okay. Justice Jackson, I think, is very much up in the air. There was nothing that would suggest to me that Justice Thomas or Justice Alito will do anything other than sort of a MAGA-style rant about big tech censorship. 
And Gorsuch, I think, will... My prediction is he will write some separate opinion where he casts himself as the champion of the little guy, (laughs) by which he means like the individual MAGA user who gets his account booted for like saying racist stuff. That'll be the the unacknowledged undercurrent. But uh, he, he will go off on a frolic of his own about like a misinterpretation of Section 230 and how much he loves the underdog and how smart he is. So that's that's five four for an at least a narrow upholding of the preliminary injunction, maybe six three. That's my prediction. Okay. I'm gonna say that I don't I'm not as sure about Barrett. I'm pretty sure about Barrett, but I'm not as pretty sure about Barrett. I, I do not think that Sotomayor is gonna go off on a Gorsuch style frolic. I I I would count her in our column, even though she asked some really weird questions. But she had a great moment where she said, at what point and I'm paraphrasing, is your law so badly crafted that it's your problem to explain to us how the hell it works? That was a good point. Yes, I agree with that. Okay, well, Corbin Bartold of Tech Freedom, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to link to your article and um, come back when it uh, it checks out or for the next round of this disaster. Uh, Yes, at the rate we're going, it will be uh, full employment for me for uh, many Supreme Court terms to come. (laughs) I'd love to love to come back anytime. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise It to Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise It to Media, LLC, all rights reserved.